Good morning. I'm Rhonda. This is Pat. We're part of the women's ministry here at Kirkmont, and uh, we have a new studio set up here. We may or may not be remodeling BJ's office, but I guess we'll see next week <laughs> if we finish it. Um, we are back for another edition of Let's Talk Table Talk. We're doing the November 2019 edition. It's on gratefulness. And this week, we're talking about Eric Alexander's article, Gratefulness and God's Sovereign Goodness. So that's the third article, like page eight, if you're on a hard copy. Um, otherwise, look it up online and see what you think. So God's sovereign grace, or goodness, rather, and gratefulness. Kind of what we talked about last week. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he, he starts, starts with the same say. kind of story about teaching children to say thank you. Um, he talked about his parents telling him to say thank you very much, um, which I think is a nice addition. But what he talks about is that we need to have gratitude for kindness and generosity. So when he was given a gift by someone, his parents would prompt him to say thank you very much. <clears throat> and Alexander points out that we need to remember that God is lavish, and I love that word, is lavish in his generosity and his goodness toward us. So um, he, he goes back to a scripture that we've talked about before, First Thessalonians 5.18, that we are to give thanks in all circumstances. And uh, sometimes, we've talked about this, sometimes it's hard to give thanks for the circumstances that we have and what we're, what we're trying to work through and with. And maybe we don't even have to give thanks for the circumstance, but maybe for the growth yeah. that God produces in the circumstance, right? Because he goes next to Romans 8.28, for, um, for those who love God, all things work together for good, which not everybody likes this verse. Um, <clears throat> And, and you can see why, you know, because so, people throw it out there, again, almost in a trite way that's, that's not very helpful. Um, but Alexander says, you know, he's actually assuring, he being Paul, is assuring every believer that a sovereign God is at work in every circumstance, including the suffering, including the groaning, you know, and it's for the lasting good of his people. And what I wrote when I read this article, you know, I underlined that, and I said, do we believe this or do we live like we believe this and that's kind of what we've been talking about the last few weeks right um you liked the j.i packer quote that came next i did he was talking about the difference between common grace and special grace and in describing common grace he he talked about how it is um, all the blessings that god gives just to everybody in the world and he says Every meal, every pleasure, every possession, every bit of sunshine, every night's sleep, every moment of health and safety, and everything else that sustains and enriches life is a divine gift. And so that's common grace. It's what we all experience. Uh, today happens to be a sunny day, and the weather's going to be gorgeous. And so we can walk outside and enjoy the springtime and the sunshine. And that's God's common grace to the world. But then he goes on to talk about special grace, and you wanted to talk about that some. Well, I think this, you know, I, I had never heard those terms, common grace, special grace, um, until I began my Presbyterian education, I guess, here <laughs> at Kirkmont. And so, yeah, common grace is the benefit, you know, everyone benefits from it, right? The example is typically that the rain falls on the wicked and the just, right? This mm -hmm. idea that farmers... Um, you know, one's a believer, one's not. They're both sowing their crops and doing their work, and they both benefit from the rain. You know, God doesn't exclude the rain just to the believer's uh, field kind of thing. But special grace, special grace is the gift of salvation to the elect, which is huge. And it ties back to um, Romans 8.28 that we, that we quoted, that all things work together for good. You've got to remember verse 29 and verse 30, because that is the chain, the golden uh, chain of redemption kind of thing. It's this idea that those who he foreknew, he predestined, those he predestined, he called, those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he glorified. So special grace is kind of a big deal. <laughs> we, we can all revel in, in the common grace and, and the beauty of um, what God has given all of us, but take heart 
that God will finish what he started. He has already completed it, right, in Christ's atonement for us. So um, it, it's there. So don't forget to read all the way to verse 30, or, you know, read the whole chapter, I guess, if you're going to go to Romans 8. Read the whole thing. It's probably my favorite chapter yeah. in all of Scripture is Romans 8, all the way from the beginning, um, which says, for there, there is, no there is now yeah. no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then it goes all the way down through, you know, you, this has already happened. You've already been predestined. You've already mm -hmm. been called. You've already, all these things are past tense. And so it's accomplished. It's already done. And we can rest in that knowledge, which is, as Rhonda's saying, that's a huge thing for us to know. I will throw another plug for the Kelly Mentor Bible study on the life of Joseph, um, because she, in talking about sort of, you know, the, the good and bad that Joseph experiences, right, the bad at the hands of his brothers being sold into slavery and ending up in Egypt, and then again at Potiphar's wife and that accusation and stuff, in talking about um, his brothers coming back now, and Joseph is in a position of authority, she says, we'll witness God and his covenant with Abraham, pressing forward through Jacob's family, consuming every good and bad action along the way as fuel for his plan of redemption. So if you don't like Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good, like think of it in that sense that God's plan consumes all that other people, you know, might see as a disruption, right? Mm -hmm. It's all used for his good and his glory, and we're going to get there. Like Pat said, the work is accomplished. So, um, again, awesome study. <laughs> I'll see if BJ will put the link in the notes um, for us. But, yeah, I couldn't get over it, just the idea that he's consuming the good and bad action. Um, do you want to go back to the lavish idea? We kind of talked about yeah. about that a little bit, that, that I think common grace is where you see maybe the lavish goodness of God. You know, his, his actual uh, wording there is that God's nature and practice is to lavish his goodness on his creatures. So if you just... If you just take a look around, we talked a couple of weeks ago, I'm going on the wildflower hikes with Vivian every Saturday morning kind of thing. And if you just look at how many things he created for our pure enjoyment, how many different amazing things. We have, we have found fungus in the most bizarre shapes. We have found uh, bellwort, which I didn't even know existed, but is apparently all over the hillside. Um, in Hocking Hills there. And this last week we found Jack in the Pulpit, which is just a hysterical little wildflower that who would even make this up, you know? So if you, if you just think about the enormity of God's creation, and it's there for our delight. Yeah. It really is. One, one of the things that we talked about was not only does God create these things, but he's created us so that we recognize them and he gives us delight in them. He gives us the ability to delight in them. And so we can walk outside and see wildflowers that we've never seen before. Or we can look at the clouds and say, you know, what, I wonder what that he's thinking like, about, yeah. you know. <laughs> uh, so it, to me, it's amazing that we have the ability to delight in his creation. And I, I, going back once again to the idea of God being lavish with us, I, that is such an idea to be able to stop and think about and to think of God. We delight in what he's done, but he delights in us. And that to me is, it's, it's an overwhelming hard, right? Yeah. It's like, kind of hard. Seriously? Because you generally tend to be irritated with yourself <laughs> for one reason or another. Um, so I think sometimes, especially perhaps as women, um, we have a hard time believing that God would actually delight in us. We feel like he's still erasing this or photoshopping that or fixing something instead of... I have some suggestions. <laughs> suggestions. <laughs> Can you do this gray right here? Um, yeah. But no, God truly delights in us. Yeah. Um, and th the other main point of this article um, is really that it, he's not 
we're to be grateful in all things, right? And he is lavish in his gifts to us. But his purpose is not purely our comfort or yeah. our happiness level. Yeah. Um, his purpose is our spiritual well-being, right? To take us to that place of glorification. So we might get a little uncomfortable along the way. Um, I've found that sanctification is um, a bit like sandpaper. I don't know if <laughs> that's heretical to say, but no. it feels like that sometimes. So, um, yeah. It's... C.S. Lewis talks about that in his book, Mere Christianity. He talks about how when, when God begins the process of building us and conforming us to the image of Jesus, it, it's like doing a big remodeling project. And, you know, we think he's, he's going to, like, you know, repaint a room. And instead, he comes in and he starts knocking out walls <laughs> and making spaces bigger and adding on. And the purpose of that is he's creating a place for himself to live because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we think it's just a little thing, you know, a little mm -hmm. touch here and there, and it's going to be a little bit better. And no. We're being conformed to the image of Jesus. That's actually Romans 8.29, and we kind of skipped over that. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So that's what's got, what God is doing in us. Um, I, I was telling Rhonda, I heard a speaker one time who talked about um, if you ask parents in Japan what it is they want for their children, they want their children to be successful. And if you ask American parents what they want their children to become or to be, they want them to be happy. <laughs> That's not what God is doing. He is not worried about successfulness. He's not worried about happiness. What he's doing in us is creating holiness. And he is setting us apart for himself, for his specific use. And that is a very different perspective about what's going on as we're growing in Christ. Yeah. And I think it's, again, we need to be grateful for the, grateful for the process um, that we are in this creation, that we can experience, um, you know, the, the lavishness that God has given us and, and the delight there. Uh, but no, in the eternal scheme of things, that he's he's working on our spiritual uh, yeah. progress, our spiritual maturity, right? And we are moving towards that glorification. And so we can be grateful for his sovereign goodness, even when we don't understand the whys. Uh, just don't get into the weeds on why with God. I think you're going to lose that Every battle <laughs> or lose your sanity <laughs> along the way. Yeah. Um, so work on that posture of gratitude and thankfulness and remember that we know that God is good and we know that what he's doing is ultimately for our good and we can be thankful for that. And ultimately worthy of our gratitude. Yes. You know, that's, that's what it comes down to is no matter what we're experiencing, no matter what we're going through, and, and this is hard, how do we still be grateful for the experience, for the hard things? and understanding that God is good and that he is sovereign over us um, should bring us to the point where we recognize he is worthy of our being thankful to him. And one of the things that, that I've been thinking about is um, if we're being conformed to the image of Jesus, then if we were acting more like Jesus, if we were living more like Jesus, what would that look like? How would we look and how would we be different? And that's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Am I supposed to respond? To yeah, you respond to that. Tell me what you're doing no. and then I'll do it. <laughs> I was thinking horrible jokes about Dan's sermon and the guy in the video clip and growing my hair um, out, yeah, to be conformed to the image. But that, I'm, that's not at all what you meant. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, yeah. To be more conformed to his image. Often, you know what it is? It's, it's patience and um, holding my tongue is perhaps what it looks like for me a lot lately. 
uh, and not going off on some mercurial rant um, just when I'm faced with some annoyance because I'm faced with a lot of annoyances right now. How about you? Yeah, um, just a few. Yeah, so, you know, rather than just go off on that, just sit back and and find the good and remember the Jack in the Pulpit flower or a bell wart or these memories with my kids and being thankful for that. But, yeah, holding my tongue is probably a big one. Because I and I have to think that that's a big image of God thing. Because don't you think the incarnate Christ had to hold his tongue a lot? <laughs> I, I mean, come on, you're like you're God in the flesh, and you've got these nincompoops running around, and you can be tempted <laughs> telling telling you how to do things. I'm sorry, a little off topic there. Okay, what about you? You get to answer it too. You brought it up. Um, uh, holding my tongue would be a good one. Um, for me, sometimes I'm an introvert, and for me, sometimes it's not holding my tongue; it's speaking up mm. and saying what's on my mind. Because often confrontation. Yeah, I know <laughs> confrontation is just like it's just stomach turning for me. And so to be able to speak up and and say something that I think is important, not not just whatever is on the top of my head, because that's not important. Um, I, I think well, if we actually think it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But um, yeah, that would be that would be a hard one for me. And also not getting not get. You mentioned getting down in the weeds. Mm -hmm. um, it's way easy for us to get down in the weeds and um, try and make everything perfect. Yeah. And. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And I have to accept that. I like perfect. I don't. I don't ever <laughs> see it. But you know, I have this we're on image. this side of the fall, guys. It's not. <laughs> it's not there. It's not going to happen. So just understanding that um, it's not going to be perfect, but it can work, and that is acceptable. More than acceptable. He it's can fun. work. He yeah. can work, and he does work in it. Right yeah. in those very flaws that we find so frustrating. Yeah. I used to say I didn't want him to have that much to do when I got to heaven. Like I wanted, you know, sanctification to be relatively progressed <laughs> so that when I got there, it was just, you know, the final um, Instagram filter, you know, fix the lighting sort of thing. But yeah, not going to happen. Not going to happen. Yeah. So be thankful for the process of sanctification. The, the other thing I think for us to remember in this is he is sanctifying us as a people Yes, he's working in us individually, but he is working on his people Community, together. Yeah. And so that means sometimes we're rubbing up against each other and things are hard and we don't like the way they're going. So we have to hold our tongue or we have to speak up. Or, or we <laughs> hold Both our tongue or at speak the same up. Time. Yes. <laughs> um, and so it's important for us to remember that we do this in community and community mm -hmm. is especially important for us right now okay. when we are separated from each other. So to be able to maintain those ties and to stay in connection with one another is, it, it's a wonderful goal for right now. Yeah, and it's important because this is kind of where the, the newness has worn off <laughs> and we're all really struggling with how long is this going to go? We can't see the light at the end. Um, so yeah, good time to think about gratefulness. Um, we've probably got one more article in here at least for next week, but I would love to see in the comments maybe some questions. I'm, I'm not going to say it's an Ask the Pastor series. No. But how about an Ask, Ask Pat? No. <laughs> Ask Pat and Rhonda series. Um, because we, I think it would be fun to tackle some topics like that. So if you guys want to jump in or email BJ um, or text one of us, most of you have our numbers anyway, uh, with some topic ideas, that would be great. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>